So Mark chapter 13 is about the second coming of Christ. I was scheduled to preach last week, and then some weeks ago, Tim said, hey, by the way, my son's getting married. Would you teach the following week? He didn't even tell me what it's about, so I go in and see it's uh, Mark chapter 13 and became convinced at that moment that Tim intentionally had Jed, his son, schedule his wedding the Friday before this passage. Uh, this passage, just to start off with, is a beast. Um, it is not a passage that is missing multiple interpretations. It's not a passage that's missing being hotly contested. Uh, it is a passage that does um, crazy things at moments and uh, brings out the crazy in people. But really, there's two ways we could go wrong here. One is, I was reading this passage and thought about that old song, The Freaks Come Out at Night. You, know, you guys ever remember that song? Some of you guys are too young for it, but... The freaks come out at night, and I thought to myself, and I was like, you know, when it comes to end times, the freaks come out. Like, all the freaks come out. People are calculating things, and they're saying it's the end of the world, and in the end, what's sad about that is they end up going a little nuts, but at the same time, they make other people go nuts, and then at the same time, they treat people really bad, which is, just so you know, directly in contrast to when the Bible talks often, and I'll tell you here in a minute how many times, talks often about the second coming of Christ. It talks about the second coming of Christ in order to create integrity, boldness, sanity in the midst of insanity, and ultimately love. And many times the crazies come out and end up not being loving at all, uh, but end up just being crazy. The other thing that we do wrong with this is we get really apathetic. It feels weird. It feels... Uh, very fantastic, like, do we even really believe this? And if we're a Christian, we go, hey, we'll still believe it, but I'm not going to think about it enough, and I can sure as heck promise you I'm not going to talk about it very much. And so we begin to be very apathetic about it. And that's problematic, the apathy and or the crazy is problematic for a, a lot of different reasons, but one being this doctrine of the second coming of Christ is all over the Bible. 300 times in the New Testament alone, at least 300 times. That's one in every 30 verses, if you broke it down in the New Testament, speak in some regard to the second coming of Christ. 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament mention it. The other thing is, is this doctrine is brought forth to produce hope. And the Bible is clear that hope is the thing that will not put us to shame. So we never should ignore this, and at the same time, we have to let the Bible guide us in its emphases, that we don't get taken off into the weeds of things that don't ultimately matter. I say this to you not at all to stand on a pedestal, but I've studied this passage. Uh, I studied it pretty significantly, and one of the things that has come to my conclusion is a lot of the places where people, when it comes to the end times, as the Bible teaches it, want to espouse great clarity. Let me just help you and tell you this. There isn't great clarity. So a lot of the times when people go, we need to go right here and left here and right here and left here and, and then do these numbers and do all these things, and here's my eschatological end times position, and it is so clear in the Bible, and then you read it and you're like really? You're more on the right side of that than they are, right? Like, of, is that really that clear? But the emphases of this passage, the emphases of these passages are very clear. They are very clear, and it's simple. The emphasis in the call to all of us is this, wake up and stay awake. Watch. Watch and be awake. That's the emphasis of the passage. So today, we don't have the time nor necessarily do I even think it's worth it to get in the midst of a bunch of the weeds. We will deal with some of the challenges in the passage because they really apply to that idea. But we're going to build this whole chapter of Mark chapter 13 around these three notions. He communicates to us real life, real life as we really live it today, real life. He talks about real healing and real faith. Okay, that's easy. Real life, real healing, real faith. Let's start. As Jesus came out of the temple, verse 13, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderfully full buildings. This disciple's looking at Herod's temple. 
the second temple, which was the grandest building, many would say the grandest building of its time, the most ornate and huge. These stones were massive. People would say the columns that built Herod's temple, it would take three men to wrap around the entire column. These stones that were built, many people said just one of them was up to a million pounds. This place was massive. It was massive in size, it was massive in influence, and it was massive in significance. These disciples who would have been Jews believed fundamentally that if this temple came down, it was connected to the return, the coming of the Messiah, and to the end of the age. If the temple came down, they believed fundamentally, if the temple comes down, that's the end of the age, and therefore the coming of the Messiah. Jesus looks at them and says, hey, your notion of the significance of the temple, which he's already begun to redefine around himself as we studied Mark, but the significance of the movement to the end, he says, is significant. What he really does is tell them that their timing might be a little bit off. He says to them, and Jesus says, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. I'm going to preempt one problem in this passage so we can get through to really hit the emphasis. There's a, a verse in verse 30 in which Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And in that passage, very specifically, it's created some problems because Jesus isn't just talking about when the temple will come down, but he clearly begins to talk about the end of the age. And so people in the end, many people, uh, will say, see, Jesus just got it wrong. Well, the reality is, if you understand both the language and the flow of this entire passage, he didn't get it wrong. When he says these things, he speaks about the destruction of the temple. With Within that generation, just over 30 years later, the temple is destroyed by the Roman army under the leadership of Titus. And Jesus is saying to them, these things are going to come about. But just later, after he says that, he says, nobody knows the day or the hour. So he's answering their, answering their question by separating it, saying, some of your question, when the temple's going to be destroyed, it's going to happen in this generation. But as to the final day, the end of the end, no one knows the day or the hour. Okay, now as we get that, let's continue to move. He says, there will no longer be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now he gets into real life. He's responding to his disciples' question about the destruction of the temple and their heart longing for something to be done. These Jews felt like they were under the oppression of, the oppression of Rome and they wanted to be freed from that. They felt the anguish, they felt the angst, they felt what every human being feels when they're being oppressed, when they're being mistreated, when they have hopes that cannot be fulfilled. They were hoping for resolution. They were hoping for redemption. They were hoping for renewal. And Jesus begins to say, as you hope there, Hope out, hope more significant, hope bigger. But in the meantime, understand real life. Because a bunch of people are going to come and tell you where hope is and why it's there and they're wrong. He says this, as he sat down on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And now he talks to them about real life. And Jesus began to say to him, see that no one leads you astray, okay? Let's just be honest here for a minute. Given the moment in time that we sit in, many of you need to hear this statement. Don't let people lead you astray. And then he begins to tell them about real life. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. They will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place but the end is not yet. So look at what he does. He goes through in verses 5 and 6, and he says, don't be led astray. False Christ will come. Wars will come. Natural disasters will come. Look at verse 8. Persecutions will come. Deep level persecution. You will be beaten. Verse 9. You will stand before governors for my sake. You will be handed over. 
Brother will deliver brother over to death, verse 12. Fathers will give up their children and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated for my name's sake. So he says very clearly, false Christ, wars, natural disasters, persecutions, but the end is not yet. Okay, so when we're sitting here at this moment, hear Jesus' words. He's saying, this is real life. This is living in the real world where sin has already torn asunder that which God called good. He says the creation is still good, but it's warped, it's twisted, it's distorted. Evil has come into it. Evil has come into the world and into our very hearts. Therefore, there will be false Christs. Because sin is in the world, there will be wars. Nation will rise against nation. There will be wars on nations. James says there will be wars in our own homes. That's what James says. What causes fights and quarrels amongst you? Is it not because you want what you don't get and so you fight and quarrel? There's wars among nations. There's wars in our homes. There's wars within your own heart like Paul talks about. What I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. All is the result of sin persecution is in the world, it will come upon these disciples. It very well may come upon or has come upon some of you for standing for his name at great cost. Brothers handing you up, fathers handing you over, children handing you over to be beaten, to be flogged, maybe to the point of being killed. But here's the point that Jesus is trying to make very clearly. False Christ, wars, natural disasters, persecutions are not unique. They're part of the real world in sin. Don't chase after those and go, see, the end is coming. He says they are but birth pains. These are in the world and they feel wrong. Don't get me wrong when I say this, and Jesus would be saying this to you. Don't get me wrong. They are not the way God created the world. They are not the way things are supposed to be. Paul says this in Romans chapter 9, that creation groans with eager anticipation the day it will be liberated, freed from this sin and anguish, the day it will be freed from wars and persecutions and natural disasters and sickness and disease and hatred. It longs for that. You and I long for that, regardless of who you are that sits in this room. Hear me on this. This is so important. If you sit in this room and you're not even a Christian, there's no way, there's no way on God's green earth that you open the paper, if you're human at all, and you see that 10 people were mowed down and killed in Roseburg, Oregon, there's no way that within your gut you go, that is just not right. And I tell you, if you sit in this room, even if you're not a believer and you feel that, you have to ask yourself the question, why do you feel that? Why, when you look at a six-year-old child with brain cancer, do you go, that's just not right? Why do you look at a massacre like this and go, that's not right? Why is it that you feel things in your own heart that you go, that's just not right? We all feel this. We all feel this groaning for a better day for a new day when these things will be gone. But as of right now, because we live in a world of sin, this is real life. This is the real world. They're not unique. This is the result of sin that should cause us to groan for a new day, for restoration, for renewal. Those things should be there. And what Jesus is doing at this moment is preparing his disciples that's what parenting is. Parenting is preparation. I've told you many times before, I have four kids. All of them at this moment, under 10 years old. And every day when you're teaching and instructing your children, like Jesus is doing to his disciples right now, you're preparing them most of the time for tomorrow. But you know that in preparing them for tomorrow, you're preparing them for when they're 30. So for instance, this last week, my son, who's nine years old, 
got his first pair of glasses. He inherited his mother's genes, and so he finally comes to the point where he's got to get glasses, and he's nervous to go in. Are they going to shoot stuff in my eyes? Am I going to get glasses? But then when he gets the word that he's getting glasses, he gets kind of excited, and he starts sending text messages to my phone of the pictures of him in glasses. Do you like these ones? And he chose these black kind of square-rimmed ones that go back and have little red accents on the side, and I think he looks great in them right? He gets them and he comes home and he's so excited. I got new glasses, but then it dawns on him that he gets the glasses Saturday and not Sunday, but Monday he's got to go to school. And not all nine-year-olds treat each other great, right? So he knows at this moment, what is everybody going to think? And so we have this moment to instruct him for Monday. And as I'm instructing him for Monday going, buddy, listen, When they say to you, they may say something to you like, hey, four eyes, right? The moment that they say that, here's what you need to just look right back at them and go, I'm just so happy that I can see. And at the end of the day, you need to understand that what they say to you Monday, they're going to forget by Wednesday because they're just going to be used to it. So have the courage, go to school, look them in the face, be thankful for what it is, and In the midst of that, you'll be fine by Wednesday. Now, here's what I realized the whole time I'm teaching him this is I'm preparing him for the next Monday, but in reality, when he's he's 30, maybe, hopefully not on Thursday, but when he's 30, (laughs) when he's 30, he's going to have people go, you're a slug. That idea is stupid. You look like an idiot. And if he hasn't been instructed up to that point to handle those realities, whether they're accurate or not, He's not going to flourish in life. And that's what Jesus is saying to them, is you're looking forward to a truth that's there, and in your way is significant challenges, huge obstacles, massive pain, massive anguish, but it's the real world. It's real life. And in fact, in this passage, he begins to speak in such a way in this next section, which is open to all types of interpretation. But at the end of the day, very clearly, Jesus begins to speak about this abomination of desolation. This abomination of desolation. Now, every interpreter would say that the abomination of desolation is an idolatrous, an idolatrous desecrating of the temple. Okay, this is in verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And he begins to say, this is a massive trial, a massive tribulation, unlike anything you have ever seen. And essentially what Jesus is saying is, you're going to experience all these bad things, false Christs, wars, natural disasters, persecutions, and at the end of the day, it may, right, we're not going to get into all the interpretations, it may and very likely will get worse than you have ever seen because of this abomination of desolation, this desecrating of the temple. Well, you're like, desecration, abomination, desolation. Well, just think about the word desecrate, right? And again, I'll bring it up. I'm a father of four. I I know this word well, right? Like the ability to go in and just ruin something, whether they be walls, pianos, clothes, rooms, an entire house, a car, desecration. So I like hummus a lot. You should too. I know you all don't, but you should. And, and hummus is great. When you get a new tub of hummus, there's this plastic that's really tightly sealed over the top. And when you pull it off, if it's good hummus, it's spread out like just perfect. Like you just see this spread and you're like, that's amazing. And then a lot of times there's like pine nuts in the middle of it. And it's incredible. And I love getting the first chip and just taking the hummus and hearing the crack of the chip and the taste of the hummus. It's perfect. So I did that yesterday. Opened a new tub of hummus, took the cracker, ate it, and then I walked over to sit and watch the ASU game, which, by the way, that was an entirely different team than his play. <laughs> like, I sat there yesterday going, what? Where did these guys go? What is this? This is, that was awesome. I'll say that. But they looked incredible. So I sit down to watch the game, and as I'm watching the game in sheer, utter enjoyment, my enjoyment turns to massive frustration because of a desecration. So one of my children, yet to, I will leave unnamed, has the tendency to be in all kinds of things and get their hands extremely messy from putting them in different parts of their body to playing in the dirt to dirt under their fingers. It's a total train wreck. So I open the hummus. I leave it on the table. I have the chips there. And this human with dirty mitts walks over and scoops up a massive heap with their fingers, 
nasty, dirty mitts out of my brand new, only one swipe hummus and puts it in their mouth. And at that moment, after saying this passage, I'm like, this is the abomination of desolation. Like, <laughs> this is it. They're standing in a place they should not stand, like this passage says. They're desecrating it, but they desecrated the tub of hummus. Okay, we understand desecration, but this is on a way higher level than my tub of hummus. Something here happens to such an extraordinary level, which we will leave for this moment to you reading more about, and we won't get into it, but it's desecrated. But here's what I want you to see in the midst of this. In a very real sense, okay, this is a moment. You can determine when it happened. You read your commentaries or your books. But in a very real sense, Adam and Eve were an abomination of desolation. When they chose to not trust God's good word, and in so doing, unleashed hell on the earth that now because of their disobedience, this one man's disobedience, sin and death spread to the whole world, Paul says. Because of this one man's disobedience, sin and death spread to the whole world, now there is false Christ, there is wars, there is natural disasters, there is disease, there is divorce, there is pain, there is anguish. There is evil in the world, there are murders in the world. In a very real that way, very real way, that's true. And it continued on, even in direct definition of what most interpreters would say the abomination of desolation is. Prior to Christ's birth, there was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes who literally went into a temple, kills pigs in the midst of the temple, and creates these riots of which they said, you have desecrated the place of the very presence of God. And if you so desire, in this interpretation, there will be a day in the future, maybe a very specific day that this is spoken of, where somebody will sit in the holiest of place in the temple and desecrate it once again. But in reality, the Bible says that this whole world is the dwelling place of God. It's in him, in God, we live and move and have our being. And it's been desecrated by sin. And we all know it. Regardless of what we believe, this is why there's all types of endeavors out there that foundations fund to try to make the world a better place. Again, regardless of who you, are, who you are and where you sit on the faith spectrum, why in the world are we trying to make the world a better place? Better from what? Better why? We're all after healing because real life doesn't live up to human standards. It's not the way it's supposed to be. So we look for real healing. And the Bible is very clear right here about where real healing comes from. It comes from the coming of the Son of Man. Look at verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven. And the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus Christ is returning, and he's bringing healing with him. This passage, you could say it like this. Jesus Christ is returning, and he's bringing summer with him. He uses this illustration of the fig tree. And he says, from the lesson of the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and it puts out its leaves, you know then that summer is near. Now, this isn't a great lesson or image for those of us who live in Arizona, right? Because we don't yearn for summer to come. We dread when summer comes. Ah, oh! right? Like, I, I still, to this day, like, it's just starting to get cold. And I'm like, well. Eh, It'll be 100 again before you know it, right? It's supposed to be 93 today. It'll be 100 again before you know it. But in Denver, where I grew up, summer was amazing. The cold goes long in Denver into the spring. But when it hits, you have this real sense of life coming about. 
When I go to my parents' house for the summer, my mom is an incredible gardener. And you sit outside and the flowers are in perfect bloom. The trees have leaves all over them so you can go out and sit in their shade. And at the end of the afternoon, almost every afternoon in Denver, the clouds roll in and just rains just for a bit, cools you off, and then you just sit there. And summer is amazing because it's beaming with life. Long gone in the summers of Denver are the winters that snowed in March, right? But now you're into summer and this moment is amazing. Gone is the winter, here is the summer. And then you're sitting there going, and when summer comes, that means the Broncos are about to start, right? And as long as they have Peyton Manning, we're feeling okay, right? Pray to God he doesn't get hurt today. But you love summer there. That's what this is speaking of. But it's speaking of summer coming directly along, healing coming along with the coming of the Son of Man. Now look at this. And I want to paint this picture because the Bible does it so extraordinarily well. But in those days, this doesn't sound so much like spring or summer, like we would be talking. But it says, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So here's the scene. Jesus comes with an entourage. He comes with an entourage, the darkening of the sun, the moon not giving its light. Now, there's a moment of this that's terrifying. We like the light. We don't want to live in Alaska in the winter, right? We, we love the light. But what's amazing is the book of Revelation says the same thing. There will not be sunlight or moonlight, but that God himself will provide the light. So imagine the day when Jesus returns. The sun goes dark, the moon goes dark, but the whole earth is being lit up with his presence. And then it says the stars fall. I find this very interesting because many of us would far prefer Jesus' first coming to his second coming. We'd far prefer the, the first coming. We follow a North Star to be led where we are. And we come and we find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. First coming. Second coming. Stars are falling out of the sky. We come to find Jesus, not a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, but with a robe dipped in blood, riding on a horse with a sword coming out of his mouth. You choose. <laughs> right? That's incredible. And here's the thing that the Bible's saying about Jesus when he comes in all his glory, that he's coming with the clouds, with the glory cloud. He's coming to heal, to restore, to renew He's coming that at that moment as the hope of the world, that all of the cravings of the human heart, that the world would be set straight, that our homes would be set straight, that disease would be abolished, that there would be no more murder, whether that be with the sword or with your mouth, as the Proverbs say. Your words, your tongue, James says it, but the Proverbs say it so precisely. They, our tongues have the opportunity to bring life or death. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. But after Jesus' returns, Jesus returns, your tongue will only be used for fruit, not for poison. This moment in which he comes back to heal, to renew, to restore, to rebuild. There's a song I love that says, to only my maker, my father, my savior. Redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, rewarder of the whole world that he's made. So now when he comes with the clouds, it's in eager anticipation, the groaning of all of creation that's longing for the day of redemption is saying, yes, the king has come. He's come to restore it all. He's come to renew it all. He's come to rebuild it all. He's come to be the rewarder of those who seek him, as the Bible says. This is no minor, minor moment. It's the removal of all of sin, of all of death, and its effects of all evil to bring back the way God intended the world 
to truly be. It's a rescue. Now, let me stop really briefly and say two things that really are the only two things at this moment that are obvious about the end times. And I, by this moment, I mean not just this preaching moment, but really at the end of the day when you get to it. Two things that we know. The first one is he's definitely coming. And you'll know it. Look at what it says. I mean, it is very, very clear. And they will see. This is very literal. It's very true. He's coming. I don't know how it's all going to exactly be, but you'll see him. And he's going to come with great power and great glory. That's one thing we know. He's definitely coming back. Now, here's the second thing we know from this next section. Verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So here's the two things we know. He's definitely coming back, and you don't know when. Okay, let's be honest with each other here. I don't care how many charts you do. I don't care how many mathematical equations you do, how much you nuance the Bible. Jesus doesn't know. You don't know. Okay? Let's just get that out of there. There are signs. There are things pointing. We know he's coming. Therefore, be ready and be awake, but you don't know when. I'll free you from the burden of having to figure out when. You don't know. The angels in heaven don't know. He doesn't know. Only the Father knows. Now, this is where I want you to be really, really honest with yourself. If this is definitely going to happen, it's going to happen like this, and he's coming forth to bring healing and restoration, we can clap in this moment and get excited. But seriously, truly, do we care that at the end of the day, will we walk out and heed the 300 plus times in the New Testament, the one out of every 30 verses that lead us directly to say, stay awake and watch. Not look for, not calculate, but be ready. Watch. Will we truly think about that? Or realistically, let's be really honest, sitting in this room. In 2015, Gilbert, Arizona, one of the fastest growing cities, greatest place for families by multiple publications, upper middle class people, that it's so easy to drive past those who are even poor in our community. Do we really care about this? Or in fact, have we gotten too comfortable and too secure to really want it. And we're not a monolithic group in here. I promise you, the people who sit in this room with chronic illnesses that believe in their heart of hearts that Jesus is coming to take away sin, death, and the devil, and all of its effects, which mean disease, don't yawn. Those people that are in chronic illness don't yawn at the idea of the return of Christ. Women who are in this room who've been abused or are who are in an abusive relationship right now don't yawn at the idea of the return of Christ. Babies who are being killed in the womb right now don't yawn at the idea of the return of Christ. People that are being slaughtered in Syria and running away as refugees and cross the border and just feel like they've been free only to hit a door that they can't get through don't yawn at the idea of final restoration and the return of Christ. People who are being murdered and persecuted and sawn in two or burned alive don't yawn at the idea of the return of Christ. The men in this room who are massively addicted to substances or to pornography that hate it and see what it's doing to their family but don't know how to get out of it, don't yawn at the idea of the return of Christ when all this will be taken away. The people who struggle with insomnia right now that quote the verse he gives to his beloved sleep, don't yawn at the idea that they will have a good night's sleep in the new heavens and the new earth after Jesus' return. This is real life, and this is real healing that comes in and only in and through Jesus Christ, which will lead then to real faith, 
what does real faith then really look like in light of the real life that we're living in the midst of sin, in light of the idea that Jesus really will return and bring real healing, what then does real faith look like? We're going to walk through this passage and then make a couple other observations. One, if you move back up in verse 13, right in the midst of the section that he says persecutions will come. In verse 10, he says, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. That in the midst of persecution, Mark puts this word very clearly that they will testify before governors and that in the midst of this, in the midst of horrific, horrific challenge and having things brought upon you just because you proclaim the name of Jesus, the gospel will go out to all nations. Here's one part of real faith, evangelism. That regardless of the opposition, we begin to, through love and through sacrificing of ourselves, speak the name of Jesus. That no one will get us to shut up, just like they couldn't get the apostles to shut up. You determine, if it's right in the sight of God, for us to obey man or obey God. We will obey God. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We will not bow down. He will rescue us, but even if he doesn't, we will be burned alive. Real faith sits there in the midst of that. Real faith speaks of Jesus. Real faith endures in the midst of great opposition. Look at verse 13. 13, 13. And you will be hated by my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, I want you to hear me. This isn't William Wallace endurance because William Wallace is so strong. It's because of real faith. Those who endure to the end will be saved aren't saved because they endure. They endure because they are saved. And by they are saved, I mean the faith is real. It's really taken root. You can't knock it out of them. That's why Paul says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor opposition will be able to separate me from the love of God. You can't knock this out of me, regardless what's brought at me. Those who endure to the end will be saved. True faith will speak of Jesus. It will stand for Jesus. What is, is true about real faith? Real faith recognizes what God being the judge means for them, which is this. Real faith understands we're not the judge. Sin provides a temptation to you and I every single moment of every single day to put yourself on the judgment seat. And there's only one judge and you're not it. He didn't put you on the judgment seat. Francis Schaeffer has this incredible line um, that shows what the judgment will really look like for many of us. He, it's, a, it's a thought experiment more than a line. And Francis Schaeffer says this. You, we're all so good at judging. He said, imagine this. Imagine that God puts an invisible recorder around your neck. And it only starts every time you say, you should do, or they should do. And at that point, it starts recording. And every time you say, you should or they should, or they're such idiots because they should, or I can't believe they have that view, they should. Every time it does that, it records you. And then at the final day when Jesus returns and you stand before him, he pulls this recorder off of your neck that you're going, I didn't even know that was there. He pulls it off your neck and he goes, I'm gonna be unbelievably fair. I'm not gonna judge you by my holy and righteous standard. I'm gonna only judge you by your standard. And then he plays it. And then he stops. And you look back at him on your face. And we realize even in that moment, we can't even live up to our own standards, let alone God's. And at that moment, it'll be very clear. He's the judge and we're not. Now, this presents us with an incredible problem. Because the return of the Son of God is the hope of the world. The yearning of every human heart in the way I've spoken of it. Sin resists God. That's true. But the hope of every human heart and that we want things to be better. We want the healing, right, in that moment. Now, 
If we're in the dilemma of the world desperately needs Jesus to return, but the reality is when he returns, we are fully exposed, that he knows the thoughts and intentions of our hearts, what then? How do we long for it if we know we are going to be exposed by that? There's a passage in Mark in Matthew chapter 23. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to turn there for you. Matthew 23 that literally most commentators would say sets up this moment where the disciples ask the question about the temple because Jesus makes the statement where he says, see, your house is left to you desolate, right as he's in the temple. So they're going, what do you mean? The house, the temple is going to be left desolate. Then they ask the question. And this sets up in Matthew, the same section we just read in Mark. But here's how it starts, okay? Remember what we're asking. How will we stand in the midst of being fully exposed? Jesus said this, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered you, your children, together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not come. So here's what he does at this moment. Jesus presents and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as a hen gathers his chicks, but you would not come. He's bringing forth an image that in a barn that begins to burn, this has been told time and time again that a barn that gets burned, a hen will go in, gather the chicks under its wings, and then cover the chicks like this. The barn falls down and burns, completely burns down, hits the hen, they will walk back in afterward to see a charred hen with wings surrounded with chirps of the chicks underneath. And Jesus is saying, it's coming. The end is coming. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Weary and heavy laden by the realities of your own sin. Weary and heavy laden by the realities of sin being in the world. Weary and heavy laden by what's happening in the world. Come and you will find refuge in me. You will find shelter in me. Come. But if you don't, C.S. Lewis speaks to this. This quote's going to come on, and we're going to end with this, and then we'll end in prayer for all of you who want to come up and pray. C.S. Lewis says this, God will invade, but I wonder whether people who ask God to intervene openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it's the end of the world. When the author walks on stage, the play is over. God is going to invade, all right. But what is the good of saying you are on his side then, when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, something it never entered your head to conceive, comes crashing in, something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left for this time for this time, it will be God without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying you choose to lie down when it becomes impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen. Whether we realized it before or not, now, today, this moment, is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It won't last forever. We must take it or leave it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have come to bring salvation to all that which you have made. And God, that there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved but at the name of Jesus Christ. So I pray now that we would choose to be found in you through faith in you. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.